Well, friends, welcome back to the first of our six-week series on evangelism, principles, and perspectives. We began last week by looking at God's heart for the lost and the joy that you and I receive when we hear the call to be His witnesses in the world. I hope you had time to, this past week to write down your top 10 list. Who are the 10 people that if God moved in their life, so to save them and bring them to Him would bring you the most joy? If you didn't have a chance to write those 10 names down, I want to encourage you actually to pause this video if you're able to right now, or maybe come back to it if you're watching it live, and write those 10 names down. Here's why I think this is important as we begin. We're going to be mostly spending our time talking about principles and perspectives in evangelism. And as we do that, I want you to have the names and faces of people in your life so that these principles and perspectives can become personal in your life. Uh, so take a minute, feel free to pause if you're able to right here, take a note card maybe, and write down the names of 10 people, a top 10 list. Who would bring you the most joy to see God move in their life? Take that card, place it in your Bible, and begin praying. And let's just see what the Lord Jesus Christ does with our prayers. As we begin, I want to take a moment to talk about privilege. Now, privilege is a buzzword today. Phrases like check your privilege get thrown around. Society is imploring us to examine our privilege in the world. Privilege can be seen as a bad thing in today's day and age, something almost to be ashamed of in certain contexts. But I want to set the stage for evangelism for us in the context of privilege. More than likely, if you're listening to this lesson, you have been given a tremendous gift. You have been afforded a tremendous amount of privilege. No, it's not hearing me teach and speak. It's if you're a Christian, you have been given the gift, the privilege of being called, of being called a son or daughter of God. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He knows us and we know him. And friends, that is a tremendous privilege. This morning, this morning, there are billions of people on planet earth who do not have that privilege. It's a gift more precious than gold. Friends, if you are in Christ, you have been afforded the greatest gift the world could ever imagine. And what we need to realize is that this is a gift that not everyone has been given. Billions and billions of people across the world have absolutely no access to God's Word. They have no way of hearing of the saving work and the message of the gospel. And we do. All of us who are on this call right now, who are listening to this video, have a tremendous amount of privilege by knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. So as we begin our study, I want to ask a question in light of our privilege, our gift from God, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with this gift? What are we as a church? What are you as a family or an individual? What are we going to do with the gift God has given us? How are we stewarding it? And this morning or this evening, whatever it may be that you're watching this, I want to take a moment to look at how the Apostle Paul stewarded this gift. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 11 all the way down into the next chapter in chapter 6, verse 2. So get your Bibles out. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 11. Let me read it for us. Paul writes, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. 
And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for their sake and was raised. Verse 16, And from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world back to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Chapter 6. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you look at those passages, those verses, it's clear in Paul's life that his response to the gift of God was to share this gift with others, to participate in the work of evangelism. That's what we see in this text, Paul giving his life so that others might know Christ. And it's my hope to bring to our attention a few things in this text that should characterize our response as well. We want to look at why we would evangelize. In other words, what's our motivation for evangelism? Second, we want to examine what are the means of evangelism. Mainly in that section, we'll look at the message of the gospel very briefly, but also the method of the gospel and the man or woman that God chooses to use. Finally, we'll take a look at when should we evangelize? When are we to evangelize in light of the immediate need in the world? First, why? Our motivation. Second, what? the means, third when, the immediacy of the message. First, we'll look at why evangelize, our motivation. Look back with me at verse 11. Paul writes this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Here we see Paul's evangelistic heart to persuade others about Christ. And Paul is very clear about his motivation for this from the beginning. He is motivated by fear. The fear of the Lord, it's what causes him to try and persuade others to know Jesus Christ. So what does Paul mean by this? What is this fear? Is it like a fear of heights or maybe the fear of spiders? Not exactly. Certainly this fear communicates a sense of awe and reverence. You can think back to Exodus 3 when Moses encounters Yahweh in the burning bush. There is certainly awe and wonder in Moses as he encounters the living God, removing his sandals, bowing in worship. It's certainly reverent awe. But I think that we've tempered down the idea of the fear of the Lord in our day and age to make it more manageable, something easier to swallow. Friends, you know what I think the word fear means? I think it means fear. I think it means Moses was afraid of God as he met him in the burning bush. And I think Paul was similarly afraid when he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. We don't like to say that. We don't like the idea of a God that we are afraid of. We like a God who is kind and compassionate and meek and full of love. We don't like the idea of being afraid of God. So why do I say that Paul was motivated by fear? Look at verse 10 just prior to where we began. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Of course he's fearful. God is going to judge the world, and this should give us all a healthy dose of fear. So I have to ask ourselves, in this day, in this age, friends, where is the fear of God? Who fears God in the 21st century? Where is the fear of God in our churches? Where is the fear of God in our homes? Where is the fear of God in our own hearts? One commentator writes, Our God today is so small and our sense of self is so large. 
We fear God so little that we seldom sense the seriousness of sin. And we sense the seriousness of sin so little because we seldom fear God. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul was motivated by a right understanding of who God was. He saw his character, his holiness, his purity, his righteousness, and his judgment seat. And he was afraid. But while he was probably afraid for his life in Acts 9, he wasn't afraid for himself here, for he himself here in 2 Corinthians. Paul knew the outcome of where he would stand before the judgment seat. He was afraid for others. He was afraid of others meeting the Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, at the judgment seat apart from Christ. Think about Acts chapter 10, verse 42. And he commands us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Paul's fear was that people would meet Jesus Christ for the first time at the judgment seat, and it motivated him to share Christ with others. But friends, this wasn't the only motivation that Paul had. He also was motivated by love. Look at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. It is the fear of God that that persuaded Paul to try to persuade others, but it is the love of God. It is the love of Christ that controls him. The Greek word for control is soneko, soneko. It means to hold together with constraint, to compress And so here is Paul, held together, constrained, compressed together by the love of Christ so much that if it were not there, you can see that his life would fall apart. You see, God doesn't want Paul or us to be motivated exclusively by fear, though that would be a right and valid motivation in light of who God is. He compels us with his love. Is Christ going to judge mankind for the sins he committed? Yes, he is. He's righteous. He's just. But because of his great love, he has also provided a way out, a way of redemption, a way of salvation. What is this love that controls Paul? It's the good news of the gospel. It's the news that, yes, God is going to judge the world for its works, but there is one who've never sinned, who never fell short, and he offers himself to you here today. Friends, if you're listening to this message right now, and maybe by some chance you have never heard of this message, that Christ poured out his life for you on the cross, let me invite you right here, right now to receive the gift of Christ's life for yours, your record before the judge in exchange for his. You can receive this gift today. And it's this love that controls Paul, and it controls you and me. It should motivate us to love and cherish our Savior all the more, because this is the gospel. This is the love of Christ that controls Paul, So friends, I have to ask, has this gospel changed your life? Does the gospel control you? Because Christ our Savior died for us. As Christians, we should be so gripped, so moved, so captivated that we would want to serve King Jesus, not out of a sense of duty, not out of fear of alone, but out of love. Friends, you do not need to convince me to remain faithful to my wife and to my children and my family because I love them. I want to. I want to serve them. It's my joy to lay down my life for them. And so church, does the love of Christ control us in such a way that we are compelled to serve him? Paul's motivation, the fear of the Lord and the love of Christ. Second, we see that God's chosen means for the mission is the message and the man. In other words, what is the instrument in which Paul's ministry is going to take place? What's going to empower this mission? Look back in the text at verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is Christ in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Paul is clear. This mission is from God and the power is found in the message of the gospel alone. It's the message that has power to change lives. Paul didn't trust in big programs. He didn't trust in extravagant methods. He trusted in nothing else but the gospel and the message of Christ dying on the cross. And friends, we shouldn't trust in anything else either. If we want to steward our life well, if we want to use the gift that God's given well, make it about the message of the gospel. Now, we're going to come back to the message of the gospel more in a later session, talking more about what is evangelism and what isn't evangelism, and maybe what is the gospel and what isn't the gospel. But here now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the method, you and me. Look at verse 19. Paul writes that this message has been entrusted to us, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. The power is in the message, but here's what's shocking. God, in his infinite wisdom, has ordained that men and women are his method of delivery. God entrusts the message to us. God makes his appeal through us. Isn't that remarkable? The same God who created the universe, who flung the stars into space, who created the mountains and valleys and waters and rivers, he chooses to use us. God, if he wanted to, could come and speak into creation, into mankind, regenerating the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. He wouldn't have to use us. But that is not typically how God chooses to work. Yes, there are times and examples of God moving in mysterious ways. But typically, God chooses to work through men and through women in the lives of others. He has instead chosen to use men as his method for his message. And Paul knew this. Think about Romans 10, 14. He writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How will they call on him? How will they believe in him? There's the message. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? There's the method. It's men. It's women. Friends, God's chosen plan for bringing about salvation in the lives of men and women is you and me. He wants to use you. He wants to use you on your kid's soccer team. He wants to use you in your office or workplace. He wants to use you in your neighborhood or apartment complex. He wants to use you. Now, I think it might be fair to ask, why? I mean, I'm nothing special. I'm not articulate. Maybe you're saying, I've never been to seminary. I don't know all the answers. Are you sure God wants to use me? Friends, I believe he does. And I think the scriptures testify that. But that's a question I've asked myself many times before. Why does God want to use me? On one hand, that's a question that we may never know the answer to. But on the other hand, I think the only answer to that question is that it must be for my good and his glory. For my good and my joy and God's glory. Think about it. There must be some reason that God chooses to use men and women in the world. There must be some good for us to be gained by sharing the message of the gospel. And I have to think, if we think back to our introductory message, it's for our joy. Friends, it's for our joy that God allows us to be engaged in the ministry of reconciliation. And you can be involved too. This isn't just for pastors. It's not just for ordained full-time ministers. It can't be because I don't know your neighbors. The pastors don't know your neighbors or who you work with. Only you know your colleagues at work. The pastors don't. The full-time ministers don't. You don't have to be on a college campus and you don't have to be an overseas missionary to be a messenger. Friends, do you believe that God not only can but wants to use you to be an agent of gospel ministry in the life of your non-believing friends, in the life of your top 10 list. 
Finally, we're going to look at the immediacy of Paul's mission. Remember, the gift that we've received, it's a life with God. It's salvation. It's to be part of God's family. Paul tells us there's an urgency to sharing this gift. Look again with me at chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What are we going to do with this gift, Paul says? We can't receive it in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The entire context of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, down to chapter 6, verse 2, is evangelism, as we've been talking about. It's a ministry of reconciling lost men and women back to God. And this is Paul's life. Look at verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of God, we persuade others. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he, and he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him, do you see that? If you've received the gift, you're no longer called to live for yourself. Down in verse 19, he's entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And in chapter 6, verse 1, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. At the conclusion of this section, from 5.11 down to 6.2, Paul ends it this way. He says, For in a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He's quoting Isaiah 49.8, where the prophet Isaiah writes to a people who are in exile, and he tells them that one day in the future there will be a day of salvation and they will be returned to their homeland. He had spoken of a time when Christ was to be manifested in the flesh for all mankind to be redeemed. And here Paul is transferring this prophecy of Isaiah that was looking forward to when Christ will come to a time when Christ had already been revealed. There is a favorable time. There is a day of salvation. But it's not in the future anymore. The day of salvation is now. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The word behold is an interjection that's telling us, stop, pay attention, look at what I'm saying right here. It's of critical importance. And Paul says that twice. He uses it twice to underscore the urgency. There is a time to receive the gospel of grace, and that time is now. Because today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may not be the day of salvation, friends. There is a now to faith. There may not be a later to faith. For most of us here, we need to remember that there is an urgency for people in our communities who are outside and far from Christ to respond now to the day of salvation, to place their faith in Jesus Christ now. This is certainly a message for people in our communities and those who are far from Christ to hear. But this is also a message for us. It's a message for the messengers. Because while there is a favorable time to receive the gospel, there is also a favorable time to deliver the gospel. And that time is now. This isn't just an exhortation to receive the gospel urgently. No, friends, for us in the church, this must be an exhortation to preach and to teach and to share the gospel urgently. And I know that you may be thinking to yourself, well, I may share and I may share this message, and it may be rejected in this favorable time. I could go out right now and go to a mall or go to a shopping center and find someone and share the message, and they could reject me. And not to sound harsh, friends, but their rejection of the gospel message is not on you. Humbly speaking, it's on them. We are called to deliver and to share the good news, but we cannot force anyone's repentance. We can't manipulate that. We have to trust and pray that God and His Spirit will work. You and I are called to be faithful. But what if? Have you, what if we ever considered this? Just humanly speaking for a moment. What if? What if, humanly speaking, someone missed the day of salvation because the ambassador for the King of Heaven missed his appointment to tell them about it. 2 Corinthians 5.20 calls us to be ambassadors for the king of heaven, called to deliver the king's messengers 
to, to deliver the king's message of good news, of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's our job, friends. But what if the king had appointed a day and the message never got to them? Fortunately, we know that that doesn't happen. We know that God ordains all things. But from an earthly perspective, may it never be that we miss a divine appointment. One commentator reminds us of this. He says, our message is all that stands between heaven and hell. And the time for that message to be delivered, friends, is now. There may be no tomorrow. The only time that matters is now. Friends, we have the greatest gift in the world, an everlasting treasure, reconciliation between sinful mankind and the righteous king of kings. And this treasure was bought by the king's own blood. It's a gift waiting to be received. But before it can be opened and enjoyed, this gift must be delivered. That's the call for us in the work of evangelism, in the work of evangelism to deliver the gift, to deliver the good news, to share the message of Christ. Friends, will you take part in delivering this gift, this message, to your friends, your family, the people around you? Okay, I, I know this is evangelism, principles, and perspectives, but, but I can't leave us without any practicals. Uh, I, I love practicals. I love getting out there and knowing, what, what do I do with this? And I think if I just left you right there, you might be left saying, this is great. I'm just going to run to the local gas station and, and tell everyone I know, and, and, which would be wonderful. And I don't want to stop you from doing that. But here's one practical, one next step for us. At the end of each lesson, I want to have something that I like to call just tool time. Here's one thing that you can do to take what we've done and apply it in your own life to help us solidify what we've learned to move from what we've learned in our heads and what God has stirred in our hearts to what can we do with our hands in the world today. So today our tool time is an exercise called silent outreach. You should be able to find that on the website. It's a document right there. It's pretty self-explanatory. But Matthew 9.36 tells us that Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion for them. We're filming this in the age of COVID-19, so certainly we need to exercise caution and abide by all state regulations when it comes to the crowds. But in that same spirit of Matthew 9, 36, I want to ask you this week, would you position yourself somewhere, somehow, to see the crowds? Maybe it's at a grocery store or at Target or a coffee shop. Maybe it's on your company's weekly Zoom call. Maybe all you're able to do is pull out a few pictures of people on your top 10 list. But my hope is that sometime this week, you might position yourself to see people, to follow the tool time right there, the uh, silent outreach document, to pause from the busyness of your life, your work, your errands, and really see people, to try and see them as Christ might have seen them. And as you're observing... I want to encourage you to read a few of the passages noted in the document and ask yourself the attached questions in the document. Let's begin our journey into evangelism by praying that God would shape our hearts for those that are far from him. Amen. I hope this has blessed you. I'll see you again next week.